Hello, I'm uh, Dr. David Maloney from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center uh, in Seattle, and I'm joined by my colleagues here, Dr. Karen Jacobson from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Dr. Loretta Nastapool from MD Anderson. And we just had our uh, second day of the hematologic uh, IWCAR-T and had, had a wonderful discussions on lymphoma jam-packed morning. I guess uh, for me, the, the, big, the big news is we finally have randomized phase three trial data with um, actually three clinical trials in large cell lymphoma and pretty exciting results. How, how, do you, how do you interpret them? Yeah, so I mean, of course, we are talking about the three randomized trials, two of which were positive in favor of CAR-T in the second line for high-risk relapsing large B-cell lymphoma patients. And so that's practice changing. I think um, Lysacel and Axicel are now available to those early relapsing patients in the second line. Um, and I think that's, that's for the betterment of patients. I think the other key thing is, you know, all of these were approved on single arm phase two studies with a lot of discussion about the differences in the patient population and how the trials were conducted. And we kind of have a little bit of a level set where we're, they were all done in similar patients. Those that we feel were the highest unmet need in terms of poor outcomes with standard salvage and auto transplant. And so it's really interesting, in my opinion, to see that at least two performed really well and much better than what we had at our disposal otherwise. Yeah, I think it's important to remember, though, that, that just for the audience, that these trials were not CAR-T versus transplant. Everybody wants to try to compare that, but it's really CAR-T versus the intent to transplant. And the, really the reason these trials win is that the, the patients that were selected for the trials had to have relapsed within a year of their primary therapy. So they're either primary refractory or had early relapse, and we know that that's a notorious group where salvage, trans, salvage chemotherapy and transplant doesn't perform very well. And that's what we saw in the two trials is that less than 50% of the patients actually got transplanted. In fact, it was between 35 and 40% actually even got to the auto transplant. So, so it does lead a little bit of a controversy about what do you do for a patient if they've already gotten salvage chemotherapy and had a good response. I mean, are you gonna still transplant them or based on this, are you gonna go straight to CAR-T? Yeah, I, I'm hoping that that happens less and less. I'm hoping that there are earlier referrals from the community because of these trials. Um, but I do, I, I sort of agree with the statements uh, that were made during the session, which if they, someone comes to me in a good response to salvage that they've started in the community, um, I probably will uh, continue the salvage chemotherapy and take them to an auto transplant. I think the other question that comes up is, you know, these patients come to you even before they start salvage, but you might need to bridge them with something. And what if they start responding to something after you've collected their CAR T cells, they're in manufacturing, they're responding to that salvage as a bridge. It's very hard for a lot of logistical reasons, I think, to switch, uh, switch gears at that point. I think we're committed, at least at least at our institution, committed to CAR T cells for those patients. Yeah, I think we would too. What, what about yeah, it? I, I agree, and I think at least from the TRANSFORM study, we do recognize that there's a good portion of those patients who had one cycle of salvage chemotherapy and still went on to CAR, and they did quite well. And I think that highlights a key aspect here is how do we find optimal candidates for CAR it's those patients where the disease kinetics allows us really to manufacture a product and deliver it safely. And so having good disease control, lower tumor burden in a situation where they're not progressing, they're probably going to do better with CAR. So I still think we'll pursue CAR for many of those patients that may have a reasonable partial response uh, while we're waiting on CAR to get set up. So this, this, um, this study was moving CARs from the third line to the second line, but we also heard some intriguing data about trying to move CAR T cells even even sooner. What was your impression of, I guess that was the Zuma 12 data? Yeah, I think the Zuma 12 data, I mean, it's a small number of patients, um, but we've seen uh, from small numbers of patients uh, on clinical trials, we've seen as it expands to larger patients, the data be really reproducible. So I thought the data looks terrific. I mean, to see that high of a CR rate, um, you know, to CAR T cell therapy and to see that durable uh, um, a response rate is really unheard of. And so I think, it, my impression of that is that uh, if you can take high-risk patients and you catch them in response to a therapy before they're bound to become refractory, CAR T cells work even better. And so I think we should be trying to find those patients that we can treat even earlier uh, uh, in their disease course, not necessarily without any chemotherapy, because I think you need to, as Loretta said, need to you know create the disease kinetics such that you can manufacture CARs and the patients don't get too sick. Um, and uh, I think I think we could be you know, really uh, saving people lots of lines of therapy down the road. 
And I think the other important thing too is that we saw aspects of really healthy T cells that were not you know, beat up by several lines of prior chemotherapy, but also the toxicity was not worse. So it can be done safely. And so I think this now opens the door to moving it even earlier. So how do you define that high risk patient population where you're willing to forego an anthracycline? Yeah, I think that's really the the key thing is like how how do you know how do you do this study the follow up study for this and I think the so, to, so again this study looked at people with very high risk disease they had to have a double hit or or a high grade B cell lymphoma and have a DOVO four or five interim PET scan after two cycles and so the real question is <clears throat> how would you just do this on an all comers type basis can you find enough high high enough risk that you don't have to have an interim PET scan to, to make that decision. And I think that's what the discussion is to try to use a high risk IPI. But then, you know, I think that's still complicated <clears throat> to figure out how to do that because the age adjusted IPI or an, an IPI is going to give you a score based on being older than, you know, a certain age. And that's, it's tricky to really find, are you getting the biologic patients that you really found in this trial? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think that r repeatedly with all of our you know now uh, genomic subclassifications of large cell lymphoma, I think the IPI has been uh, remarkably steadfast in its ability to predict prognosis. I think there uh, there is probably there, there's a lot more reluctance I think to open a trial of CAR in the front line for a high IPI when you don't know how CAR is going to perform in that setting. I think having these 40 patients on Zuma 12 will um, improve the appetite to sort of take that risk and take that leap, I hope, for uh, a randomized trial. Yeah, and I think the key part is it's randomized, so we'll, we'll get an answer, but you want to reduce the barriers, and IPI is really easy to derive, and so if we have to wait on a molecular profile to come back, you're going to select out for good risk patients that are able to allow for that lag time, and so then your control arm is going to perform well. We all know that there are patients that need treatment quickly, but then the question is, are also those patients going to do well with the CAR-T approach? And so I'm really interested to see how this study goes, and I'm excited for it. Yeah, I think it's really going to be exciting to see how, uh, whether we can do that trial. <clears throat> I guess next up was um, uh, mantle cell lymphoma. We, we saw continued follow-up that looks very exciting. Yeah, Brexit, I think the key aspect is that you have to remove those mantle cell lymphoma cells. They're more likely to have circulating cells. The manufacturing is a little bit different. And it also allows for some exploration of a BTK inhibitor in terms of how that might impact also the phenotype of these T cells. A little bit different lessons to be learned there, but the outcomes look quite good, particularly in patients who would otherwise have poor or dismal outcomes, those that are failing BTK inhibitors. And so I think it's intriguing. I think um, it, you know it's a rare tumor type, and, and uh, they have less options and so this does provide an effective strategy. And you both gave excellent, outstanding talks on follicular lymphoma. Uh, Karen, you, you presented the, the Zoom of 5 data update. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, with longer and longer follow-up now, we're, we're we're seeing really, really durable responses. Uh, you know, median progression-free survival of almost 40 months um, with um, uh, you know, really deep responses, much deeper than we see with any other available therapy. And we're even seeing sort of in retrospective analysis, a survival benefit o over other available therapies. So I think this really does have a place in the treatment landscape for follicular lymphoma. But as we've been discussing for all of these other lymphomas is how do you pick those patients who should have it? And, if, and can we pick those patients early in their treatment course so that they can get CAR T cells earlier and maybe save them lots of lines of therapy? And I think that is the struggle with this with this disease. And I think the perception is that these patients are going to live a really long time, and so we don't want to harm them with our therapy, and they have a number of options. So navigating that treatment landscape is no small task. But I, I do agree with Karen. Some of these patients were young. They were progressing through multiple lines of therapies quickly, and, and they derived really favorable outcomes. So now the question is, um, can we get broader access? Can we deliver it in a way where it could be done outpatient and safer uh, that might reduce the healthcare resource utilization so that more patients patients will have access to this. I, I hope that happens. So can we cure follicular lymphoma? I think we can. The problem is it's probably not all patients. Um, and right now, we don't have enough predictive biomarkers to understand how we select them out. But in my practice, young fit patients that are progressing quickly and they kind of look and smell like transformed disease, I just haven't proven it with a biopsy. Those are the patients I'm going to take to CAR-T all day long. Yeah, so lastly, we had a lot of discussions about uh, multi-antigen uh, targeting, whether it would be better to come in with a second uh, CD22, for example, or CD20 on top of a CD19. 
and a lot of discussions about mechanisms of escape and relapse. And so I think we're starting to learn more biology about T cell expansion and about, uh, about these factors that might make these treatments even work better and safer. So I think it was a great, great morning and uh, thanks for uh, joining us for highlights from uh, IWCAR-T. Thanks.